welcome to the Dividend Cafe. We are getting ready to go into another weekend, and that's sort of what I'm talking about today is the last couple of weekends and this general era of Sunday drama of Sundays being kind of hijacked by some distress event, some announcement, some alert in financial markets. And so I uh, first of all will say to those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, congratulations, you have successfully pulled it off. There is no reason for you to know what I'm talking about. Um, the uh, types of things that I'm referring to are major, substantive, and in our world, they're world changing events. I'll explain it all in a second. But if somebody um, has their capital stewarded and managed by someone else they trust and they're spending their Sundays going to church and being with their family or, or you know, watching the afternoon game or whatever um, and not even aware of these types of things, then, then I think that's kind of for the best. It's not really an option uh, all the time in our world, but of course, you know, we really are talking about the exception, not the rule. And it was 2008 where... This idea of kind of a Sunday interruptive moment was was happening very frequently in the uh, time period at which Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, in early September of 08 were put into conservatorship was the first kind of weekend enhancing moment. I remember that one vividly. It was my seven year wedding anniversary. I was away with my with my wife. And then it was just one week later that um and this one may have caught up into Main Street even more. Maybe not, because I don't know. Uh, but the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy on the following Sunday evening was another, you know, just moment of it was a little less techy back then. I think social media existed, but it was more text and television and things like that, email. But, you know, the, the alerts and the beeps and the tweets and the pop ups kind of uh, has intensified with technological expansion and, and ongoing digital mediums since 2008. But the Lehman weekend, there was a weekend where it looked like the deal for Morgan Stanley uh, to uh, sell a big piece of it to Mitsubishi and raise the equity capital necessary to kind of save the company. That one was near and dear to me because I was a managing director at the firm then and there was a whole lot of economic ramifications, you know, for me personally. And we went into that weekend Friday thinking the deal was de dead. And Sunday we kind of realized it was back to life. And Monday everything closed. Well, you know, there were other moments too. Citigroup uh, almost was uh, dead again over a weekend. And there was a Sunday night where the feds kind of announced a whole new level of backstop. And that changed things. So anyways, I don't want to talk about 08 forever. But I, those are just periods where... Was there individual Sundays where I could kind of tell you like where I was and what I was doing? And yeah, it definitely took over an entire, you know, Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening or whatever it was. And for the, it just, it doesn't happen often. And there's a reason Sundays, you know, it's something where there's an intent for policymakers to kind of wrap something up or a deal to come together after the markets have closed on a Friday and before the markets have closed on a Monday. And it's a little hard to do these things in the middle of the market. They're in, they end up having an impact in equity markets or interest rates, or bond markets, sometimes currencies. And, and so getting a little period of respite from when markets are open is often what will happen and Sundays fits the bill. Um, I don't know. I think that uh, the other aspect is the globalization of markets that there's also a desire to get it closed Sunday before Sunday night because Sunday night in America is really Monday morning in Asia. And then you do have a market opening dynamic, albeit a different part of the clock, a different part of the globe. All that to say that we, um, two Sundays ago from, you know, when I'm talking, I believe it would have been March the 12th. I had gone down to a, a coffee shop near near my house at the beach here in Newport and was going to um, work on a book I'm writing for like five, six hours, just kind of sit and write. And I didn't write a word. And I had set up my kind of station and this and that and and was ready to get into it. And then, you know, these beeps and, and pop-ups and alerts and emails. And 
I'm in correspondence with other friends of mine, different analysts, hedge funds, colleagues, and there's dialogue. And one minute they're announcing a new rumor, and the next minute, uh, you know, and on that particular Sunday, it's about three in the afternoon by the time an official announcement came, it had been six, seven, eight, nine hours of, you know, back and forth and, and speculation and whatnot. But by, I think it was three in the afternoon, uh, the FDIC announced they were backstopping the uninsured deposit levels uh, for depositors at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in New York. And I was taking my son to the Laker game that night, and then all of a sudden I kind of had to go through all this stuff. We had a little time um, before, before we were going up for the game. And, you know, it's a major deal. You have uh, unlimited deposit uh, insurance being announced above and beyond the legal limits, and the Fed, Treasury, and FDIC co-announcing together, the rationale being uh, to, to control systemic risk. And the futures went up. It didn't last. The next day ended up not being, not being good, but it looked as if that was going to soothe markets for a little bit. And it kind of forced a rewrite of a lot of things I'd been working on that day for the next day's commentary. And then now, just this last Sunday, you know, it's just one week later. And again, I had just gotten back the night before from a couple of days in Vegas with some friends watching basketball. And I was up very early Sunday morning to get my daughter out to an all-day volleyball tournament. And when I got there, I knew I was going to be there like nine hours, but she's only playing two or three times. And so I'm setting up the computer. I have, you know, I, I have like all this catch-up work to do from being out on that Friday and Saturday. And I had... Um, writing projects, reading, just, you know, my normal stuff. And um, now I've set up kind of obnoxiously at this volleyball tournament. There's over a thousand people there, my, my iPad and my laptop and my phone. And, and it look like I have kind of a, vir a full office deal. And uh, then again, can't really get into that rhythm of all the work and the inbox and the projects because you start hearing reports that UBS has made an offer, the Swiss are not accepting the offer, Credit Suisse wants this, UBS is doing that. And then I have the AirPods in, I'm listening to Bloomberg Live, and next thing I know I recognize the voice of Colm Kelleher, who was the CFO at Morgan Stanley when I was there. And he is the chairman of UBS now, announcing that indeed UBS was doing a sort of rescue acquisition of Credit Suisse. And uh, there's a whole lot of ramifications out of that. Now, now markets responded favorably to that um, throughout this last week, even though there's been some up, down, and whatnot. You know, you've had a lot of big up days, including Monday and Tuesday. I don't mean to spend so much time talking about this setup, but, you know, this is, in a way, not just kind of oh, nice reminiscing and interesting calendar interventions to volleyball tournaments and and book writing and coffee shops and whatnot. There, you don't have major announcements and 50 tweets and texts and alerts and pop-ups, whatever else, when, when everything is kind of hunky-dory. Like this is a reflection of a tremendous amount of financial distress that's come into the marketplace. And I think that this, um, this Credit Suisse deal with UBS is a very big deal. And it actually has not gotten all the attention this week. In a normal week, it would be the biggest story of the year. And you're talking about a 167-year-old bank, uh, you know, $530 billion of assets, $490 billion of debt. And uh, we think of, for good reason, Swiss banking as kind of this gold standard of solid, reliable, impenetrable stability. And now you have a bank that was on the verge of insolvency being bought at a 96% discount to its equity value high. And we don't really know how bad things would have gotten had they opened up. I think um, $245 billion of their liabilities were customer bank deposits. It was 150 to $160 billion of long-term debt. So there was a systemically high level of counterparty exposure and creditor exposure. And this is kind of the first thing I want to say that is more relevant and not backward looking or nostalgia or context sharing. Just as a basic takeaway, understand that all their PR deficiencies and political headaches and challenges in a democratic society notwithstanding, 
these bailouts and these rescue moves or whatever else they get called or loaded with or what have you. Sometimes fairly, sometimes not. Usually more nuanced, you know, meaning both. They are bailouts of creditors and depositors. And it's one of the most historically fascinating things about the TARP moment in 2008 is in a lot of ways, um, I think it fed the Occupy Wall Street, the Bernie Sanders angst of the left. It really fed into some of the right-wing populism as well that led to the Tea Party movement, eventually led to the Trump movement. Um, and, and yet, you know, there was just this incredible incapability of branding it as what it really was, which was a creditor bailout, a depositor bailout. Uh, the equity of Lehman Brothers was wiped away. The equity of AIG and Citi was basically wiped away. And, um, you know, a few companies lived to fight another day and maybe in a technical bankruptcy, they wouldn't have. Um, but the reason for it is creditors. We have a very leveraged financial system and the, the contagion effect when one uh, troubled entity doesn't pay someone it owes money to and that entity then by not getting paid can't pay another entity it owes money to and that web of complexity and potential insolvency and certainly illiquidity is, is uh, too unbearable to think about. And, and, and it would never stop at the first company. And so it's all kind of complicated. And I don't know that um, a president or a treasury secretary is able to give a speech that's going to lay it all out. But I do know that that's what these guys are thinking. I don't think any of them care one iota about the equity holders of any of these companies. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think that they're essentially trying to keep the contagion effect from spreading worse. And the reason is because of the sheer horror of contagion itself and what a financial panic looks like. But also, going forward, if you're going to have a credit-driven economy, and this is a global statement, not merely domestic, if you're going to have a credit-dependent economy, you're not able to have creditors if creditors are constantly worried about being wiped out or if creditors demand the risk premium that they should when they've seen real credit impairment. But when creditors are bailed out, it puts in a moral hazard that allows debt to trade at a lower price. It allows debt to happen at a lower price, a lower cost of capital. I think it's distortive. I think there may be problems with it, but it is right now the way the world works. And there, if there's a protected class in American capital markets, it is primarily been debt holders. Um, and the reason is not because they like those debt holders on that debt deal with that debt company. It's generally because the next day and the next week and the next month, we need more creditors, whether it's selling municipal bond offerings or buying the sovereign wealth of the United States or any other number of countries. Um, the way that which we raise money is so leverage dependent in our society that creditors have uh, really been kind of at the ground zero of these various events. And I wish that we could explain that better. Um, this is not for me to say, well, I, I think it's all good. I'm glad it works this way. I'm not. Um, but I have another takeaway as to where the real heart of the matter lies. Now, what happens? You say, okay, well, you know, UBS's balance sheet has now got a backstop. The liquidity issues and maybe even the solvency issues at Credit Suisse, that's pretty true, except for they got a $100 billion um, credit line from the Swiss National Bank. And there is, you know, now with UBS before this transaction, Credit Suisse had a $530 billion assets on their balance sheet. UBS had over a trillion. Credit Suisse had, what was it, $480 billion of debt. You know, UBS had $600, $700 billion. They didn't have anywhere near the leverage. There's a lot more equity on the balance sheet with UBS. But my point, and that's how they're able to do this transaction. But my point is, too big to fail existed for Credit Suisse on its own and for UBS on its own. And now the two put together, just trust me, this thing is too big to fail. And the Swiss National Bank is now on that uh, backstop and maybe it won't be necessary. And they do, they work through the Credit Suisse assets and UBS protects its own interest and, and we'll see. I don't, I don't have any opinion about that. It's not my point to talk about the, those two particular companies. It's to give you the context as to what caused this moment. 
was uh, the desire and need to protect depositors and creditors in a massive organization. And you could argue that it's all for the best, that the systemic risk would have been worse to not uh, go, coordinate an uh, arrangement like this. And, and I don't necessarily disagree, but I will not sit here and say that it was the right thing to do with no downside or there's no negatives or no trade-offs. And this is a very important point to me in the way I teach economics, that if you believe there's no free lunch, you have to look at what the trade-off is in any situation. And in this case, I think there's a trade-off, albeit indirect, to us. Because I don't think any of us wanted to wake up to global financial contagion under an insolvency event for Credit Suisse. But it doesn't seem like it's directly connected to us across the pond and not being you know, holders of a UBS or Credit Suisse. But here's where there is a connection in the trade-off going forward. First of all, I've been fond lately of my friend Louis Gov of GovCal Research talking about the West trading away some of its most important differentiators, uh, the, its unique value proposition in a global economy being uh, private property and a high regard for the rule of law that we have in, in the West, in particular the United States. And, you know, they forced this transaction through without a shareholder vote. Now, was that all things being equal? Was that for the best? It, uh, it may have been, you know, it may have been. I, this, the contagion risk of doing that versus something else, I, I'm open to that argument. It's usually non-falsifiable and non-verifiable, so it's kind of intellectually dishonest to even go there, but we'll pretend. However, I won't pretend that it can happen without a trade-off. I think that um, denying a shareholder vote there, these things you may have heard about in the news, it was only about 16 or $17 billion of what are called COCOs, contingent convertible bonds, that were technically alternative tier one capital. So they're supposed to get paid before equity, but after senior debt, but there are different nebulous conditions uh, that could kind of cause them to have an impairment not get paid. And in this case, they wiped it out. The, these these uh, uh, holders of this debt, again, it's a smaller amount in the grand scheme of their total balance sheet, but that money is not going to be paid back. They're liquidating that debt at a 100% loss. And yet the largest bondholder of this was uh, PIMCO here in Newport Beach, owned like $750 million of it. I mean, you know, it's not that much. Um, but... Is there a trade-off? Are there people now with some of these other hybrid types of capital structures that believe they're at risk of a cram down, of, uh, of the suspension of law, of uh, some situation where the rule of law would not function the way it's supposed to be, and uh, the way it's supposed to function? And so private property and the rule of law are not highly regarded generally on the margins during financial panics and during Sunday afternoon interruptions usually something is going to happen that works against what conventional rule of law and trade and uh, and uh, private property rights would be. And I don't like it. doesn't mean I think it, it, all the circumstances don't sometimes warrant it, but this idea that it can happen without a trade-off is absurd. Another thing on this Credit Suisse deal, by the way, is the Saudis had just put in $1.5 billion of equity capital for a 10% interest in the company, uh, so they were valuing it at $15 billion. It had been worth about $88 billion at its high in 2007. Uh, and then going into the weekend, it was still valued at about $9 billion. And then, of course, this deal UBS did valued it uh, when all was said and done at a little over $3 billion. So the Saudis are taking a massive loss on their $1.5 billion investment. Well, are they okay with that? Um, is this going to make them more likely to be an economic actor with the West? Uh, are, is there vulnerability already in the relationship between Saudi and, and uh, the United States and Western allies, NATO bloc countries, European Union members? I, th I think there, that risk, that uh, vulnerability has already been there. This probably doesn't help. So you have a few things related to rule of law, related to private property, related to the way this obscure hybrid debt security is treated in the capital structure relative to expectation. You have the Saudi consideration. So this is all I'm trying to say is that there are negatives. There are trade-offs, even as there is a positive avoiding contagion risk. 
And where does this necessity of trade-off come from? Where does this necessity of basically having to swallow a decline of distinctly Western values, rule of law and private property? It comes from the boom-bust cycle that creates these problems to begin with. And that boom-bust cycle is, in my mind, largely at the hands of the Federal Reserve. Now, in this case, we're talking about a global event. So I'm not going to sit here and just only blame the Fed. You have global central banks, call it BOJ, call it Bank of Europe, call, uh, excuse me, European Central Bank, call it Bank of England. You have various global monetary authorities, and they're all in it together, uh, exacerbating a boom-bust cycle. And what happens when the central banks exacerbate a boom-bust cycle is you get Sunday afternoons filled with financial interruption tweets, beeps, blogs, and alerts. That's where it comes from. The negative repercussions, a threat of rule of law, a threat of uh, 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 private property, that comes from the ramifications of the boom bust cycle doing what it does. It creates a Credit Suisse problem, a Silicon Valley Bank problem, something I've talked about before. Um, and, and then we sit around and want to say, look, in this moment, there's nothing we can do. We have to put the fire out. And I don't disagree in theory. I think, generally speaking, you do want to put the fire out. But I do think that when you put a fire out, it's always helpful to go back and talk about what caused the fire to begin with. And we just don't do that. That's where there's a financial vulnerability in the system. That's where there's a need for financial quality in a portfolio, for decision-making that transcends the merely speculative and that transcends the, the hopeful assumption that what has worked well in the past will continue working well in the future. We want better than that. That's why we invest money the way we do at the Bonson Group. Uh, but it's also why I want you to sort of understand the nature of the real financial system that we have, not just for what it can do on Sundays, but what it can do every day of the week. Thank you for listening to Dividend Cafe. Thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. And please share with us any questions you have, questions at thebonsongroup.com. And please support us by rating us writing a review, and sharing this with those you think would benefit from it. Thanks again for your weekly uh, role with the Dividend Cafe. I look forward to talking to you again next week. Mm -hmm.